morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you guys have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 5. If not, um, I usually send out the lesson just via email, so it's a little bit easier to follow along, and you can kind of go through the notes yourself. Um, but if not, you have your Bibles, guys, just Mark chapter 5. Yeah, I, I love that we're a little bit into this year now, 2020, and uh, every year we begin, and I've been kind of talking about it over and over again, about our New Year's resolution, uh, where we come to a part in our life where we're like, I'm looking forward to something new, and I want to change something. Who here still has something that they want to change in their lives? Oh, yeah. Still, right? Oh, most of us. But change is one of those funny things. It's a word that we like it when it's on our terms, but if it doesn't come and it comes uncomfortably, we, we hate it. Oh, yeah. Change is one of those things that it can be inspiring, but at the same time, capsizing. Dang it. Something that just changes up our life. Mm -hmm. See, we look forward to change and get excited each new, uh, new year, hoping that it will be different this time. Mm -hmm. This year, I'm going to actually stick to my goals. I'm actually going to hold on to my dreams. But at the same time, we're, we're excited for it, but we're also afraid of it. Mm. Because we want it, but we don't want it that much. Mm. We have those things that we want to change, but not yet that much. Mm. Because people will say, they'll say things, I want a personal trainer, somebody to get me fit, but also someone who's going to back off a little bit. <laughs> right? I want a friend that minds their own business. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay. You know, people want a holy church that's going to allow them to sin. Oh. They want to be around other people that are holding to a standard, but at the same time, let, let me not hold to it. Though. Yeah. See, sometimes we have that, where we want something, but at the same time, we don't really want it that much. Because the, the change that, we, that is brought into our lives, sometimes it's exactly what we desire, but we realize it costs too much. We, we didn't think it was going to afford that much. And we have to realize, though, that all these different things that we can think about change, or is it what I want, is it not what I want, we come to the resolution in the Bible, though, that anyone can change with God. Yes. And I mean anyone. Yeah. And that's where we're going to start in this story about looking at a, a story of a man who everybody in the world said that person can't change for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. And we're going to read here in Mark chapter 5, verse 1, it says, They went across the lake to the region of... Gerasenes. And so just starting here, that Jesus is kind of traveling around. Before this chapter, Jesus had just taken a midnight walk on the Sea of Galilee. He's over there walking around on the sea. He plays peekaboo pick with the uh, disciples there. And now he's landed on the other side. And on the other side of this sea is kind of where the Gentiles live. For those that don't know what that means, it's kind of like the Jews were on this side, the God-believers. Now, on the other side were the Gentiles, the people who didn't believe in God, mm. or believed in other foreign gods. Mm. It was seen as kind of like a scary place, that place you don't really want to go to. We all have, we're all different from like different countries, but you know if they talk about that one neighborhood, you're like, yeah, that's the country, or that's the place we don't go to. <laughs> Whenever my, I would act up or give my eldest brother attitude, he would always threaten me with, hey, I'm going to drive you to Compton and drop you off. <laughs> and uh, he's done that a couple times, actually. Uh, he would throw me in the car, and I'd be like, kind of trying to wriggle out and everything. He would drop me off Compton and just drive away. Uh, and uh, thank God I was wearing neutral game colors. But he would drive far, he would drive to like the corner and then come back. And, you know, I was always super scared. But, but yeah, that, that was kind of like what was going on right now. They went across the sea, and now they just, they just got in Compton. <laughs> and this is where Jesus is. He's like, hey, well, I'm, I'm coming here to find somebody who wants to change. Mm -hmm. I'm coming here to find the worst of the worst and change their lives. Mm -hmm. See, the nations of Jews, or the, the Jewish nation, always were kind of trained a little bit to be separate from the world. In a way, in the Old Testament, God was saying, hey, you're going to be a little bit separate from the world, but I'm going to bless you so that when people see what you're doing and you're following my commands, people are going to be like, I want to be like that. And whenever foreigners would come into the land, they would require them to do the same kind of, uh, same traditions, hold to the same commandments. And so now Jesus was here planting in the seeds of the apostles now, though. It's, hey, we're not going to be separate away from the world anymore. He's planting a seed in his disciples, his followers, that 
We're not just going to wait until people want to come and understand God and the blessings. Now we're going to go out into the world. We're going to push this gospel to the ends of the earth. And we see that these seeds start to bear fruit as each apostle gets pushed into the corners of the world. Peter dies in Rome. Andrew and John die in Greece. Philip dies in Egypt. Thomas dies in India. And some die in, in Turkey, Greece, and Simon the Zealot, after preaching in Africa, gets killed in England. And so we see that here Jesus is trying to teach them something new, and it actually goes on and continues in their lives. But as we continue, we're going to read this story about somebody who, in the eyes of everyone else, they saw this person like, this guy cannot change. But once you start getting to know God, anyone can change. My title of my lesson this morning is From Madman to Maniac. Point number one, the meeting of a madman. Verse two in Mark chapter five. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with the chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot and he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. So this is the person that Jesus, he just stepped foot in Compton. Jesus isn't wearing blue or red. He knows his name. And, and here, this, the first guy that meets him on the shore is this guy that everybody would like. Hey, we, we tried, and we couldn't change this man. Have you ever met somebody and believed that they could not change? You looked at that person, whether that's in your family, your friends, or somebody else, and said, I don't really think that person can ever change. Mm -hmm. And some of you are actually thinking, yeah, I know that person, that's myself. Mm -hmm. oh. Some of you think about that as yourself, I don't know if I can ever change myself. Mm -hmm. But have you ever tried to change someone like that? How it says here in the scriptures. Just throwing a chain around them, trying to push them and force them to change, only to find out that you were not strong enough to help them. You try to force them into it. See, you even wish that the chains would sometimes bind you, right? Have you ever thought that for yourself? Like, man, I wish I could just change. I wish there's something in my heart that I could just throw a, a, a noose around it and just pull it one way and my character would change. But you find out that that's still not strong enough. See, when you look at this person, you have to kind of ask, okay, were people really looking for him to change? And helping him do that? Or were they just trying to control him? Mm, wow. See, if the chains didn't work, you know, they probably went through a couple different processes, right? They would have tried a string, first of all. They would have tried a chat. Then they would have tried a rope. Then they tried to change. Like, well, uh, that didn't work. We can't do it. Well, if a chain didn't work, why, why not a chat? Why not, why not change up your, your tactics here? It's because most people in our lives, they don't really want you to change. They just want to control you. Most people want to do that. Your family, your friends, your family gets mad. Where we, we've seen this a lot of times when people want to become a Christian. Their family gets mad, not because they don't see you changing positively. Mm -hmm. It's because they like, well, I can't control him anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they get mad. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to control you with their chains, but now you're changing for God, and they, they don't like that anymore. And sometimes we can have that in our hearts a little bit. We wish to control people in Christianity rather than to change their hearts. Yeah. Man, why wouldn't that brother or that sister just do what I told them to do? Mm. Why, can't they just, why can't they just do it? Instead of like, really ask me, why not? What is in their heart that I can help them with? Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's going on deeper rather than why didn't they show up? or what? It's what's going on in their hearts. So this is what Jesus comes up to. This person that people in the world try to control but no one actually ever tried to change. Did he want to change? Well, let's read on, verse 5. Night and day among the tombs, in the hills he cried out and cut himself with stones. See, it wasn't that he didn't want to change. It was simply that men were not the answer. He was out here crying and cutting himself. Something that that if they would have just stood, stayed long enough, these guys, the, the, the community around him, they would have seen how desperately he wanted to change his heart. See, what happens is that 
People get scared of the screams, and then they miss the cries. They hear somebody acting up, they're screaming, they're going crazy. Okay, well, that's just a crazy person. I don't want to be with them anymore. And then they miss that that person is actually really hurting. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't actually dig deep. They just see the, the, the consequences of their life, and they get scared away. See, many would have seen, not have seen this side of him. They would have gone up, tried to tie him up with his chains, and then they would have gave up and said, well, he's too strong. I tried. They would have walked on the other side of the road from now on. They wouldn't have gone to that place in, in, in the, near the shore. But we don't go there anymore. We tried to help him, but we just couldn't do it anymore. The thing is, we have to understand, guys, is everyone around us has something that they want to change in their lives. Yeah. But most people will rarely cry out in the halls. They'll always cry out in the hills. Mm. Meaning that they're not going to show you their weakness before, in front of you. They're not going to come up and say, hey, this is where I really am. This is where I really am hurt. They're just going to show the consequences of it. They're going to, they're going to act up. They're going to be mad. They're going to be frustrated. And it's going to feel like it's pointed towards you, but it's not you. It's, it's the pain that they have in their heart. Yeah. You see, this was going to be awesome about this story is that Jesus sees this guy. He could have easily ran away from him. Like, man, this guy's breaking up chains. Okay, hey, man, I can walk on water. I haven't done that yet, though. You know what I mean? Like, this guy, this guy's a whole other different kind of madness right here. But yet, Jesus is going to wait and see what's going on in this man's life. We have to see here that everyone has these things in their heart. That there are many smiles that are trying to hide the tears. And actually, it's kind of funny, is that church is usually the most common place that this occurs. Mm -hmm. That people come, they hear the singing, it feels good, it's awesome, it's nice and everything, but people still have those things that they're hiding, what they're really doing in Great the depths. Mm -hmm. Verse 6, what does Jesus do? When Jesus saw him from a distance, he booked it the other way. No, no, okay. Uh, when Jesus saw him running from a distance, uh, from a distance, he ran and, and fell his feet in front of him. Uh, excuse me, on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Ian. I'm sure. Uh, my name is, is Le uh, Legion, he replied, for we are many. You know, in all four Gospels, there are only five accounts of people running up and falling on their knees before Jesus. In all four Gospels. This being one of them. There was the man with leprosy in Mark 1. 40, after he and nine others were healed, he ran back and said, thank you so much, and showed his gratitude. There was Simon Peter, after seeing his nets overflowing with fish in Luke 5, 8, saying, God, I'm not even worthy to be next to you right now. There's a young, uh, young rich ruler, Mark 10, verse 17, what do I have to do to be saved? And then finally, the Roman guards mocking Jesus when they put the uh, crown of thorns on his head. This man is, is a rare person in the Gospels. He recognized that in his problems, Jesus was the only solution. It was kind of funny, right? He runs up to Jesus and says, Jesus, get away from me. Mm. Very funny thing. People do this all the time. They run into church, they keep coming, but say, I don't want it. Mm. What are you doing here? Yeah. You must hear it for some reason. You know, have you ever said, though, that, that, that um, you know, this person, he comes over, he sees that his only solution to his problem is Jesus. And sometimes we can think that as well. Have you ever said that to, about somebody? Man, that person needs Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> now, that can't be good or bad. I don't, I don't know what's going on in your heart when you say that. But, but that's true, right? There are sometimes we recognize there's nobody else that can help this person other than God. Yeah. And at the same time, the sooner we recognize that and understand that for ourselves and others around us, then we're confident, we should be more confident in our ability to help them. Because it's not just about you. It's not about can you do it. It's all you have to do is get them to Jesus. That's it. Whether they like it or not, get them to Jesus. But then we also realize that that saying is you can lead a horse to the water but you can't make them drink yeah. isn't always true. 
man, I can't even get this stupid horse to the water sometimes, right? That's how we feel sometimes. I can't even get them to Jesus. They won't even show up. But, hey, man, it's going to be a little bit harder than that. But the most often difference, though, is going, the difference between you changing somebody and them not changing is how long you're willing to try. That's the only difference. It's how long are you going to keep putting in the work to try and get them to God? Or are you going to say, well, hey, I tried to change and it just didn't work. I'll walk on the other side of the road now. See, the world reacts to pain in two different ways. Either avoidance or action. In Matthew 8, it says that some people actually avoided passing him because he was too strong to change. In both Mark 5 and uh, Matthew 8, it says people tried to tie him up, but both of them led to failure. Sometimes we can do the same thing. We get used to passing on the other side of people in our lives because we've already tried. They need to sort it out for themselves now. I did all that I could. Or we can get frustrated and upset that they don't change. We're still there in their lives, but now it's not out of love anymore. It's out of almost frustration and anger that they're not changing. And guess what? Both of them will lead us to avoiding them one day. <coughs> In our hearts, we're just, we're, we're done with it. The things we have to remember is that there are some problems only Jesus can solve. And that means you have to be okay with people walking away from you unchanged. In our pride, we think, I said it, I showed the scripture, why aren't they changing? you got to allow them to fight God, not fight you. You have to allow that. You can't say, oh, they're not open, I tried. No, no, you're just some random person on the side of the street invited them to some church when they went to a church two weeks ago that was super lukewarm, and that's what they think you're going to. Mm -hmm. They don't know exactly what you're, what you're inviting them to. They don't know what a Bible study is. They don't know what the scriptures are and actually have someone hold them to it. No. They don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. You've got to get them to God and fight mm -hmm. God instead of fighting you. But we also have to understand that people are going to make you the enemy no matter what. You, have you ever done that where you show someone a scripture and then they say, oh, so this is what you believe? You believe yeah. that uh, we have to share our faith? What are you talking about? I believe I have to share. That's what the Bible says, right? Yeah. They're going to make you an enemy no matter what. Yeah. But that's okay. That's, that's, that's our burden to bear. But are you going to quit on people? Mm. That's going to be the difference. See, the next question is we have to ask ourselves is, well, can we help someone change who does not want to change? The answer is yes. <laughs> Wisdom tells us that they need to want to change. Yeah. No. Just because they don't want to doesn't mean that that's the right answer. 70% of people continue to smoke after they have been diagnosed with lung cancer. They know they need to change, but they still don't. Why? Because some of them tell themselves, well, I can't change, I can't move on. Um, but we have to help them still get to that point. How do we do that? Well, we got to always remember our good Christmas story about uh, Scrooge. Wow. Right? What happened to this guy? He felt like he didn't need to change, he was doing good, he had a lot of money and everything. But what, ha what he had to see in his life is that he had to see that his actions were affecting his past, present, and his future. Mm -hmm do that with people. we got to say, hey, I know you don't want to change, but I need to show you what your sin is doing to your life. Mm -hmm. What it's presently doing and, and that pain that you feel, that, that's why. And what's going to happen in the future, I'm not even talking about heaven or hell. I don't know if you believe in it or not. That's not the point. It's going to affect your life here today. Mm -hmm. And Scrooge, what happened? After he realized his, his pain excuse me, his sin was affecting all these different areas of his life, he changed in one day. Mm. One day this man changed. In the same way with the, in this story, that man took one day to change. We have to believe people can change quickly. Mm. When they get next to God, they can change quickly. Yes. I know even for myself, uh, there's a couple of different people in my life that I always kind of remember when they change quickly before the scriptures. I love lift, lifting up our brother uh, Tim back in Sydney. Um, we were studying the Bible in just one week. Uh, we got together on Monday, and then I think on Thursday, we did another Bible study. 
And he shows up the next day on Friday. We're supposed to do another Bible study. He's going to come out to a Bible discussion. And he comes up to me, and I can just see he's a bit downcast, or a lot of things are on his mind. We just did a uh, Bible study on how to follow the Bible, no matter what. And he's okay, yeah, cool, we did it. Next day, here he comes, downcast. And I'm like, what's going on? And I ask him, hey, what, what's, what's going on in your heart, man? What's, what's, what's happening? You, you look like you're thinking a lot. He's like, bro, um, man, things, things are getting hard right now. Uh, after we did the Bible study yesterday about we need to follow the Bible, I went to my family and I told them, I think we're going to a church that's run by Satan. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, uh, can we at least agree I didn't tell you to say that? Yeah. <laughs> like, can we start there? Well, he, he, he read in the scriptures one thing one day. He got there back at, at, at his house at night and said, we need a change. Mm. That, he changed in one day. Yeah. And the next Sunday, not uh, it was Friday, so two days, the next Sunday he got baptized. Yeah. It was so quick. I remember another person. His name's Joe Mike back in L.A. Uh, there was one. He came to like our Wednesday midweek services, and he only started coming to the church like one day before. We invited him one day before. And he came out, and at the end of the service, we're sharing about what we got from the sermon. And he gets up, and he stands up for good news, and he's just like, hey, guys, I just want to say um, I want to change my life. I want to change everything about my life. I want to uh, just – he was actually living homeless at the time. And uh, he's like, I just, I just want to change. I know what you guys said was right, and I want to study the Bible every day. Mm. And in my heart, I was like, I've heard that about ten times. Let's see. Mm. <laughs> that was my genuine heart. The funny thing is, next day he moved into my room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this man just change before my eyes. Every day he studied the Bible, got baptized the next week. That's wow. awesome. See, when you're not actively in Bible studies or seeing people change, like how Christ has called them to change, mm -hmm. you start to believe that neither they can or, nor that you can. Yeah. I don't know if anything's, if it's really ever going to change. See, I, I think about it with uh, Jessica Todd right now. Mm -hmm. There's no way she believes nothing can change. Mm -hmm. she, she saw her, Jordan get baptized and she's like, everything can change. We'll see if the sun's going to come up from the east. This time. I don't know, you know what I mean? Like She's like, I don't know what can change in the world. When you start to see people change biblically, then you believe it in yourself and in others. Mm -hmm. My first challenge, guys, is not to just go change one thing in your life. I want you to go help somebody else change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at one thing in someone else's life and get them before God. Yeah. Once you do that and see that people can change quickly, you'll believe that you can do the same thing mm -hmm. in your life. Point number two, the making of a maniac. Mm -hmm. Mark 5, verse 10 through 17 says, and he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep, uh, the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported to the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came out to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there dressed in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told them about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Wow, what an amazing ending to the story, right? All the people were amazed at Jesus' miraculous change of this man, uh -huh. helping him. They ran out to him, praising him. Uh -huh. They were going to throw him a little thank you party. They are going to be like, wow, this is awesome. Who cares about the pig? No, that's not what they did. They were still afraid of him. Yeah. Well. They were actually more afraid of him now. Like when he was in the cave hurting himself, yeah, we felt some things. We felt hard. But now this man has changed. I don't know if I like that anymore. Mm -hmm. I know I, I've had so many people that I've studied the Bible with or teach them the Bible and show them that they need a change in their life. And at first, sometimes they're, they're very thankful. Like, wow, thank you so much for helping me learn how to pray, how to read. But then it gets to a point where they really need a change. Mm -hmm. I don't like it anymore. Mm -hmm. can, can you please leave? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's the same thing going on here. Like, oh, that's cool. Jesus coming over. He walked on the lake. That sounds pretty awesome. But now he's calling us to change as well. I don't, I don't know if I like it. 
To be honest, it sounds like it, it costs you much right now. At the beginning of this story, this man was running up to Jesus. Now everyone was pretty much running away from Jesus. And actually, they wanted Jesus to run away from them. Why? Well, first of all, the people find that biblical repentance is really strange. That the change when you biblically repent is too strong too fast. People don't like it. That was way too quick. This man needed a couple of processes, you know, before he actually is sitting there in his right mind. They're afraid of anything that disturbs their comfortable life. The second thing is, they're scared. Why? Because it costs too much for them. Jesus just gone and killed 2,000 of their pigs. That's a lot. If it costs 2,000 pigs for this man to change, man, how much is it going to cost for everyone to change in this town? We ain't got enough pigs for all that. You know, that's what they're thinking. They're like, man, we ain't got no more pigs. How are we supposed to change it? This is going to cost too much for us. See, the Bible and God has a funny obsession of things costing everything. The Bible loves it. God loves it. He's always in the house like everything. Every time. Talking about repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 11. Every point you prove yourself innocent. Come on, yeah. It's going to cost you everything. In your life. Knowledge. Proverbs 4 7. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Discipleship. Luke 5 verse 28. Levi left everything to follow Jesus. Households. Acts 2 44. They had everything in common. Mm -hmm. See, the Bible has a, 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 an attack, attachment to calling us to give up everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how do we do this? Well, Mark 9, verse 23. Everything is possible for the one who believes. Mm. See, to change this world, it's going to cost us what? Everything. A lot of pigs. I'm <laughs> uh, it's it's going to cost us everything. Everything. There are so many people who dream about changing something in their lives. They want change, but they don't want it that much. They want to go save the world, but not that much. Because that everything that it's going to cost, they don't know if they can do it. You think about it even here. I pulled up some statistics about mission statements and statistics about the world and, and Christianity going out to the world in 2015. So during that time, in 2015, I'll just hold to these statistics, uh, there were 7.3 billion people on the earth, and 2.3 billion were Christians. For the others to be reached, those that have not been reached, for only it would take 2% of that population of Christianity to reach all of the world. If just 2% of those 2.3 billion actually had on their hearts to go and share their faith, the whole world would have been evangelized in one year. That's how crazy it is. See, Christians make up 33% of the world and receive 53% of annual income in the world. But 98% of it is just spent on themselves. In 100 AD, there was 360 people for one Christian. Today, there is 7.3 per Christian in this world. How easy it is to change the world if everyone would just say, I'm doing it. Mm. But they don't. Why? Because it's going to cost them everything. My second challenge here is making of a maniac is what is it going to cost you to actually follow Jesus? What is that one thing that you are scared to do? Go and do that and face the cost and you will see the world change around you. Sure. Point number three and coming to a conclusion. The moving to a maker. So we're going to jump over to Matthew chapter 8. This is the other um, scriptures that's referencing the same story pretty much. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 through 34. Cool. Verse 28. It says, When he arrived at the other side of the region of Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men came from the tombs and met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, uh, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from the large, uh, some distance from them was a large herd of pigs were was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, "If you drive us out, send us to the herd of pigs." He said to them, "Go." So they came out and went to the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank 
into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave the region. So we're reading in the other account, and this major thing we see in the difference is, hey, in this the Matthew account, there's two demon-possessed uh, men. There's two men uh, with uh, demon possession. Mm -hmm. But what, what does that mean? Is this, is this a contradiction in the stories? Well, we have to understand that in both stories here, that Matthew account is going to stop when people start to plead with Jesus to leave. But both Matthew and Mark, we're going to finish off in continuing the story of the one man who did change. Mm. See, in the Gospels, Matthew's Gospel was written to Jews. Meaning, it was going to emphasize on their culture and on the demon-possessed men. In the Jewish culture, everything had to be established by two witnesses. So it was going to focus on, hey, there's two of them, and only one ends up really changing his life. Where Mark, it's kind of like if you say, hey, I went to the movies. Were you the only one in the movie theater? No, we're just talking about you in the story. You're not going to say, I went to the movies and every single other person. Mark was just going to focus on the one person who ended up changing. We're going to read back here in Mark chapter 5, verse 18 through 20, about what did that one man do when he changed. Oh, come on, Sean. As Jesus was getting to the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And now he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in Decapolis, uh, Decapolis yes, uh, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. See, two men had been healed, yet only one begged Jesus to be his disciple. Jesus gave him the charge to go and evangelize all of his people. See, some will walk away from Jesus with only temporary change. I wonder about that other man all the time. I wonder how long it took him before he returned back to his cave. Back to his tombs. People today, even when they go to church, you're going to have a temporary change. This feels good. It's awesome. You get to hear a speech about it, something inspiring and a change in your life. But are you going to walk away just with temporary change? Are you going to make the decision to follow Jesus? Mm -hmm. that's, that's going to be up left to you. See, Jesus, he always has an amazing dream for this guy. To go and change all of his people? crazy story. I always wish to, if I could meet somebody in heaven now, I want to meet this guy. Mm. I wonder what he changed in his region. People would have been still afraid of him, but he, he would have been like Paul almost, right? Yeah. Yeah. He, he's like the first Paul with Jesus right here. Mm. See guys, we also need to dream, uh, dream big. We can never dream small for ourselves. Mm. Jesus did not only want this man to change, but he had a dream for him that he can change others. My challenge to you is, are you dreaming big for yourself? What is your spiritual dream for your life? Have you not just resolved to come here and make small changes, or to make a big decision and start to follow God? The Bible says that in Proverbs 29, 18, without vision, the people perish. Mm -hmm. If you're just coming here with a small bit of, hey, this is exciting, this is fun, but don't have true vision for your life and see that God is calling you, it's never really going to work out. And God, and instead, we're challenged to go from being a madman in the world, sinning it up and doing all those crazy things, to now being a maniac for God. In Hosea verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Because of your sins are so many and your hostility so great, the prophet is considered a fool. The inspired man, a person, uh, the inspired person, a maniac. Mm. See, the world, the world is crazy. There are madmen running around. But when they see somebody holding to their convictions, they're going to think you're a maniac, and that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I want each one of you to write down a city, a region, a place that you believe that you can go and change, mm. and start praying for that. Mm. Whether it's up north, Albany, mm. pray for that every single day. With it, whether it's down in Onihanga, pray for that every day and be just like this one man who changed his life and can change many others. Yeah. 
See, anyone can change guys in conclusion. Mm -hmm. But you have to be that person and choose to be that person that, yes, both of them changed, but only one made the decision to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. Make the decision to go from a madman to a maniac for God. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Awesome.